Hello, my name is George Brusiger, and uh, the topic of this discussion will be what constitutes a formal ontology. Now, what I want to talk to you uh, today about is what an ontology is and what it's not. Uh, so, coming into dealing with metadata and semantic data, eventually one runs into the term ontology uh, and it can get associated with uh, something very complex, almost mystical, and uh, what I want to deflate uh, is the idea that there's something particularly complex or mystical about the idea of an ontology, or what's also called a formal ontology, in computer science and digital humanities. So, let's get into it. What is an ontology? You could say that an ontology is a window frame which allows the expression uh, about some part of the world and the kinds of statements that some uh, domain experts say make about that part of the world. So an ontology isn't, uh, formal ontology isn't an ontology with a capital O uh, as uh, the tradition of philosophy. So a formal ontology isn't trying to give you uh, the one description of the world uh, as it must be uh, in its really real reality. Rather, uh, it's trying to model uh, a way of looking at the world that's broadly accepted uh, by uh, a group of people. That means that there are, different, there are different ways of approaching the world, which means that there are different ontologies that are valid and exist uh, side by side. So um, formal ontologies should be thought of in the plural and not in the, uh, uh, and not in the singular. It's not one ontology with a capital O, it's many small formal ontologies. So, to make a reference to the philosophical division, anyhow, this is what Heidegger would have called a domain ontology. So, why do we talk about formal ontologies anyhow? Where did they come from? Uh, how did this uh, movement come to be uh, in computer science and eventually uh, digital humanities? Well, formal ontologies started to really pick up pace in the 90s uh, when uh, researchers in computer science uh, had been making uh, data, forms, schemas, for the same kind of information over and over again. And uh, the idea came to mind to work together uh, with philosophers and build from the philosophical tradition and say, if we're describing the same thing over and over again, uh, then it's probably the case uh, that that thing has some essential elements, some essential properties, uh, which are always going to be repeated. And if we identify those, then we can create a data structure uh, and a way of representing the data that will be standard uh, for users across a domain and whenever we want to describe that kind of thing, that kind of world again, uh, we can reuse this data structure. In order to make a well-structured uh, data structure, they turned to philosophy because it had spent thousands of years uh, coming up uh, with research on how to cut up the world into discrete units uh, that are uh, sound and reusable. So, formal ontologies uh, have been developed uh, over time uh, on the basis of using the philosophical tradition, but then to create a formal ontology, uh, what you need to have is domain knowledge, that is to say the knowledge of researchers uh, who are looking at a particular topic uh, to understand what they're trying to say uh, so that you can create a structure that represents that to the computer. Uh, so, formal ontology is in the end not uh, just a mix of computer scientists and philosophers, but computer scientists, philosophers, and uh, researchers from particular domains like biology, medicine, uh, cultural heritage, who have decided to come together and do this work of creating generic models uh, for expressing uh, the world of information that they're interested in. What it results in uh, is a formalization of this knowledge into a, a particular data structure, and that uh, data structure is bound to reality. By, by that I mean that, uh, at least in the, the sense of sciences and the sense of research, uh, a formal ontology is meant to be uh, related to reality, so we don't create data structures that don't represent something that's really real uh, for uh, the researchers in question. Its function is to serve as a lingua franca uh, amongst uh, researchers in that domain to share data, uh, and uh, it should be, in the end, uh, a data structure which is processable by a machine, but understandable uh, by a human. So, 
what's the ontology for and what can we hope from it? We've already uh, moved in that direction already, but it creates a general data form to which multiple different data, uh, data structures can be mapped. Uh, it helps control polysemy at the schema level, that is to say, uh, if I create uh, a structure for describing people and I call it actor, uh, and you have a structure for uh, describing actors, as in people who uh, work in cinema, uh, that we differentiate these things and we don't mix them up. Um, in its production, uh, we not only model uh, the specific information uh, that people are interested in researching in their domain, but while we're doing that, we investigate more general concepts uh, which uh, uh, gather together the research that people are doing on a particular topic and which allow us to not only query uh, very particular topics like uh, uh, types of species, uh, but allow you to um, query more general topics like types of things. Um, if an ontology is well built, uh, then it's, uh, we've created the categories and relations in such a way uh, that we don't have to reanalyze them over and over again. So if we want to add new concepts, we either add them at a more general level or a more uh, specific level, but without having to redefine uh, all of our concepts. This should, in the end, create compatibility between different data structures and uh, eventually allow for automatic reasoning. Uh, I return uh, to this slide, which I've used elsewhere, to say uh, that the main goal of a formal ontology is not to create a model of data that's of interest to people who are interested in modeling data, uh, but it's to create a data structure that is really able to re-express information from multiple different specialists into a broader uh, data form so that their research can be viewed not only individually as the particular data systems uh, and research uh, questions that they want to look at, but can be looked at at a more broad level to see how particular specialized research that talks about the same world links together and gives us a more full picture of, of particular research topics. So, with that as background, what does an ontology look like? What is it made up of? So an ontology uh, at base has a scope, uh, and the scope of an ontology is what this uh, ontology is for, what it should talk about. So as we said at the start, uh, ontologies aren't one ontology for the world, but many ontologies for different topics. So the scope indicates what this ontology is good for, uh, because if it's not describing your area of research, you shouldn't use it. Um, then, when you've read the scope and you see that this ontology is uh, talking about the same world I'm talking about, it's interesting for me to try to adopt or use, uh, then the ontology will have a series of declarations of classes and properties. What are classes and properties? A class is a universal that's meant to represent some set of entities in the world of discourse that have a distinct, identifiable behavior and identity. So. Uh, a class uh, would, for example, be, uh, well, in this room, tables and chairs. So, table is defined as long flat surface uh, with two legs and chair, uh, I don't know, multiple surface with four legs. Uh, these are bad universals, uh, but they allow me to pick out that there are eight instances of table real tables that fit that definition of the class, the universal of table, and 32 instances of chair. Properties uh, are um, relations that can exist between classes. Uh, so uh, these formally define how two universals can relate. So you could have, for example, the property sittable, or can be sat on. Uh, and you can formally define uh, that the uh, chair, uh, the class concept chair, uh, has the property can be sat on, uh, whereas the table cannot have that property. Um, so those are classes and properties. Then, if you go digging into an ontology, uh, you have to go through the declaration. Uh, there will be a spe specification document. Uh, and uh, look at uh, the definitions of the classes and the properties to understand what they are and what they do. 
A typical class declaration uh, will have a label. The label will say, uh, this is the name of this class. Uh, it's important to emphasize that a class label uh, is just a term that helps you find uh, a familiar concept uh, in the ontology. But it's not a way of classifying things. So if you find the term uh, actor, for example, as the label for some class, then of course you could think either somebody who works uh, in the cinema, you could also think as generally somebody who has agency. Uh, the only way to know uh, what the class is really about is to read what's called the scope note. The scope note gives a definition uh, that a human can read uh, and uh, which defines precisely how this uh, class operates and what it's meant to be used for. So either it will say, this class is used to pick out all of the real world individuals uh, that perform in the cinema, or this class is used uh, to pick out all real world individuals uh, who have agency. So, that's the label on the, the scope note. Uh, another aspect is the subclass superclass. So an ontology uh, tries to build a, a hierarchy of knowledge and allow you to describe things at either a more general level uh, more, or a more specific level. Uh, so if you were to have, say, an ontology of actors uh, in the sense of people working in the cinema, uh, then you might have a general class actor, uh, which is anybody working in the cinema, and then you might have a subclass, uh, which is uh, theater actors and uh, movie actors. These would be bad, this would be a bad ontology, but you could say that every uh, theater actor is also an actor. Uh, then it would be, then theater actor would be a subclass of actor. Um, and structuring the information that way gives you a lot of flexibility because you could say, if I say that somebody is a theater actor, I've already said that that actor that theater actor is an actor, which allows me to do some interesting reasoning later on. When you're reading uh, about a class, you should look at the examples. A good ontology will have examples, so if you're confused by the definition, which can be uh, somewhat abstract at times, you can look at examples and see how this class has actually been used to pick out real things in the world. Then, as we mentioned, classes have properties. So uh, a class having a property uh, also gives you an indication of what it's for. So uh, in CDOC CRM, for example, the main, the main basic class is called CRM Entity, and it's used to talk about anything. Uh, and so it has two properties. One property is identified by, and the other is has type. Uh, that means to say that that property, or that main class, is used to say of anything it has a name and uh, it can have a type. So I could say George is an anything. Uh, so I'm an instance of E1 uh, CRM entity, which is a class, and I have the prop can have the property having the name George and have the type uh, being a researcher. So that's looking at uh, a, a class definition. Then we have property definitions. Uh, so a property, again, has a label, uh, and that label will be arbitrary, uh, so you need to read uh, the scope note to understand uh, what the property is supposed to be used for. Uh, it has the same uh, property, or the same possibility of having sub-properties or super-properties. So an example of that would be, um, you could have a property, a general property that says, has name, uh, is identified by. So that would be a super, a super property. But you might have more specific uh, types of names like has first name or has last name. Uh, these are more specific properties that you want to pick out a particular type of information, not just any name, but the first name or the last name. So there you have a, a sub property has first name, uh, but we say that that has first name is a uh, has name. What does that give us? It means that if I say uh, George has first name George, uh, then the ontology also knows uh, that that George name is in general a name, uh, which can be used for reasoning later on. Uh, 
Uh, the main difference between a uh, class definition and a property definition is that properties are used to link two classes together and tell you formally what you can or cannot say uh, with uh, the classes of the ontology. So, um, we could have, for example, uh, in a mini ontology of this uh, uh, room again, we have the table class, we have the chair class, and we have uh, the people class. So we have three, three universals in our world, and then we have instances of, of it uh, in our room here now. Uh, we might have a property uh, uh, can be sat on. So then we would have the domain, uh, then we would need a domain for that property, and if we were wanted to say about our world that only chairs can be sat on, then we could say that the domain of can be sat on is the chair class, uh, and then we would want to say can be sat on by something, who sits on things, people do, so the range would be uh, people, person, class. So as a result, you couldn't say that an instance of the table sat on uh, the chair, which is the kind of nonsense you wouldn't want to say, so the ontology would be working well. Uh, so. Those are the main things that you would look for and read in an ontology once you had found the one uh, that was relevant to your uh, domain of research. And then you might ask, uh, well, what kind of data does an ontology uh, produce? Uh, well, on the right here we have uh, a traditional uh, representation of a traditional uh, relational database. So. Normally, if you're doing some complex research and you create uh, a data structure for uh, looking at your data, uh, complex data, you would break your information into, I don't know, actors and documents, objects, uh, events. Each of these would take on a different table and you would relate them in a way uh, that was familiar to you and maybe computer scientists. Formal ontologies try to be closer to uh, a natural language uh, perspective of things. So uh, the data comes in what is known as triples, uh, and uh, those can also be described as subject, verb, and object. Uh, so, uh, and the subject will be a class, the object will be a class, and the verb is the property or the relation that we were just talking about previously. So, we can have, for example, an event of assigning an attribute, which does the assigning of the attribute to a man-made object. And that is something that, uh, with a little bit of document reading, a human understands, which a computer can process. Then, the ontology has this feature of isa that we were looking at, that you can state that some classes uh, are subclasses of other classes and uh, are the same kind of thing, and the same thing with properties. So here we can have a more specific statement like uh, there's an activity of measurement uh, that measures this pot and in fact the ontology can say that, this for, that measuring is in fact a way of giving an attribute to something, uh, that the property of measuring is a way of assigning an attribute, uh, and a pot is a pot. Uh, so it gives you a, a way of speaking of things at a very general level or a specific level and in an integrated way, which is not as achievable with, with a relational database. Another interesting thing uh, to emphasize about creating data with formal ontologies is that it forces you to be explicit about information in a way uh, that you are less so with other types of schemas. Uh, so uh, this would be a traditional uh, kind of object table you might make in research, which you would say, well, I have a thing, and I give it an ID, I give it a name, and then I'm weighing, my research involves weighing pots. So I've weighed this pot, and it's 55 kilograms. Uh, in this form, uh, I've perfectly well uh, gathered some data, and it's not bad. Uh, but I've done something here where I hid away the fact that this, this uh, measurement unit is kilograms. Uh, and I've hidden, hidden away the fact that in the real world some event occurred that made this measurement happen. So the ontology takes this, this data form and breaks it out usually into a much more explicit uh, way of representation. So this translated into pseudoxyria uh, would become there is a dimension 
the dimension uh, has uh, 55 as a value and the unit of measurement is kilograms. That thing is a dimension for this plot, uh, which uh, occurs because a, uh, an activity of measurement took place. Adding in this idea of an event between allows you to hook in more information like who measured it, when did they measure it, uh, by which means did they measure it, the kinds of things uh, that uh, aren't necessarily picked up here or are implicit. Um, so, moving on to our last thoughts on formal ontology uh, for this presentation. Um, we could end on thinking about how do formal ontologies come about and uh, why should I uh, trust a particular formal ontology. So uh, formal ontologies should come about because uh, certain researchers, hopefully interdisciplinary, uh, come together uh, and they bring together a bunch of data structures that talk about the area of research that's in question. They do an analysis of it and they try to understand what do these data structures really try and say about the world? Then there should be a dialogue between the computer scientists, between the particular researchers, whether they're looking at texts, or they're looking at architecture, or they're looking at whatever their domain of interest is, and attempt to create these high-level classes and properties that would describe any information that you would find in particular data structures. And then a lot, another thing that, they, that one does in order to uh, uh, create a baseline by which you can test whether an ontology is valid and would work uh, for a community is to write down the kinds of questions uh, that researchers want to ask of data uh, about their, uh, their particular topic and then see uh, if having built that uh, formal ontology, that system of classes and relations that describes things within a particular scope, uh, whether you would be able to answer those kinds of questions using that mini language, that lingua franca that's been generated uh, out of the study of all the different data structures deployed by researchers in that area. Um, so, uh, when uh, a, an ontology is built, it's not built once, but it's uh, continually updated by whoever uh, is involved in maintaining the standard. So, the basic idea should be that you have data structures uh, that people use in the world, uh, actually in the world, to do their research, which really talk about something that exists in reality. Those are studied and abstracted. That creates a base layer of the ontology. Then you can have another conversation about what general concepts and relations all of these abstractions that are represented in uh, the individual data structures use, and that can create a overall generalization and then we test that these things ad adequately describe the lower level concepts and that these lower level concepts really describe the data that people use to describe the real world. So, after all that is said and done, uh, what would the ontology be good for, for you as a digital humanities researcher? Uh, well, we can break that down uh, into a uh, number of areas. So on the one hand, uh, you might be in an area of research uh, where no ontology uh, has yet been made, uh, but you really find the need to share uh, information across, uh, across institutions or across uh, different software products, in which case the idea of formal ontology can be of use to you because you can adopt it and you can try to do your own study of data structures in your domain and come up with a system of classes and relations which will describe your information. Um, that would be a general contribution to uh, your area of study. On the other hand, you might find an ontology uh, that currently exists uh, that's of a, general, uh, of a general level and it's of use to you, but it's not spe specific enough. In which case, you could use the idea of formal ontology to create what's called an extension of that uh, ontology, where you adopt the classes and relations that already have been declared by uh, a set of researchers for a certain uh, scope of research and create more specific classes uh, and relations for describing your problem area. Those are the, on the side of creating or extending uh, ontologies. On the other hand, you might just find uh, that you're in a uh, project scenario where you want to share data, you look around and you find an ontology uh, that has the scope that's relevant to your data uh, and to your area of research. 
in which case you can take it and you can map your data to that uh, ontology from different structures and then begin to explore it in a, a common way. Uh, and uh, the last thing that you might be able to do or you might be interested in doing is to say, I want my data from the start to be compatible to an international ontological standard, in which case uh, you can look at different uh, data platforms that exist to create semantic data from the start and you can create what look like traditional data forms uh, to yourself and to any other researcher, but which create semantic compatible data from the start, which would mean that you've future-proofed your data and uh, made it available to researchers uh, in a way that should be uh, criticizable and referenceable into the